Welcome back. Um, we've been looking at uh, the principal component analysis algorithm and uh, we were trying to understand some of the issues related with this algorithm. We identified two different issues. One issue was when the number of features is much, much larger than n. Um, that resulted in a computational issue where uh, you had to spend order of d cube for computing the eigenvectors and eigenvalues in general, where d is the uh, dimension of your data. And we tried to solve that issue by saying that instead of computing the eigenvectors for the covariance matrix, you could compute the eigenvectors for an associated matrix, which is the x transpose x matrix, where x is the data, data set a matrix. Uh, and you can use the eigenvectors of the x transpose x matrix to convert it into the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So that kind of solved issue one. Now we will look at issue two, which we also mentioned uh, in a previous video. So the issue two that we are going to talk about today is the issue of nonlinear relationships among features. So we know that PCA is very good at identifying the linear relationships among features, but what if features had a nonlinear relationship? To motivate this, let us take a simple example where we have again a two dimensional data where let us say the data points were like this. That is the data points all lie on the circle on, a, on the circumference of a circle, let us say centered at A and B. Now let us ask the question, what would PCA give? So if I ran the standard PCA algorithm on this data set, what should I expect to see? In other words, what are the most interesting or important directions with respect to you know, the variance maximization or error minimization that PCA would uncover? What would be the most important direction? So if, if you are already seeing it, fine, otherwise uh, I uh, encourage you to pause and think about this question. I um, will answer this question now. So what would PCA do? PCA would first center this data set, which means that the center will move from A, B to 0, 0. So the origin would be 0, 0. Um, and then what it would do is it would try to find that direction where if you project this data points, the length of the errors is as small as possible or the variance is as high as possible. Now, because the points are all around the circle, no direction is more important than other direction, right? So I can project my data along this direction or this direction or this direction or this direction and they would result in more or less the same variance. I say more or less because depending on the exact data points and how they are spread around the circle, one direction might be slightly better than the other, but in general, all directions are equally important, right? So which means the PCA is going to pick one direction that would be based on how exactly these points are around the circle. But let's say PCA picked this direction as W1, the most important direction. Now, what would be W2? Well, W2 we know uh, has to be perpendicular to this W1. Well, uh, it would be this direction, let's say. Of course, I'm assuming A instead of AB, this is origin centered here. Okay, so now if we had to do a dimensionality reduction for this problem using PCA, then what would happen is the following, right? So we would compute the eigenvalues, which is simply the variance along each direction that PCA finds, and then try to see uh, how many directions do we need to capture 95% of the variance. Now, in this particular example, what would happen is your W1 will have, let's say, the most variance, uh, but then because all directions are almost similar to each other, W1's variance or the variance of the data set along W1 would be similar to the variance of the data set along W2, which means that maybe slightly more than 50% of the variance would be captured by W1 and slightly less than 50% would be captured by W2. Now, this would tell us then that if I use the thumb rule of 95% uh, to pick the top k directions, PCA would say in the standard way that you need both the directions, both the directions are important. So that is what PCA would give, right? So it would give W1 and W2 um, and both important, it will think both are important directions. 
but the real question is do we really need two directions here in other words do we really need two numbers here um, i mean uh, is the relationship such that you you need necessarily two uh, to capture two directions or is there a different way to capture this relationship okay so let's think about that so what is the real basic fundamental relationship among the among these data points uh, by the virtue of the fact that they lie around a circle the following is true right uh, the relation between features is the following so now any data point i can take in this data set and it has to satisfy f1 minus a squared plus f2 minus b squared equal to r squared where i say when i say f1 this is feature 1 the axis y axis is feature 2 why because this is the equation of uh, circle uh, centered at a and b with radius some radius r so which means that every data point is on the circle and so it satisfies this equation <coughs> now let's expand this equation and see what we get this implies we get f1 squared plus a squared minus 2 f1 a plus f2 squared plus b squared minus 2 f2 b minus r squared equals 0 fine so this is the basic relationship that um, that all the data points satisfy and as we can see this is not a linear relationship why because this has f1 squared term f2 squared term and so on so this is not a linear relationship that is that's obvious from the picture but also from the equations okay so now let's do let's try to do the following let's take the feature f1 f2 this is just some data point i mean maybe f1 is 5 f2 is 10 some numbers right so two numbers and now what i'm going to do is for each point in my data set i'm going to map it to some other data point so f1 f2 if f1 f2 was my data point in my data set i'm going to map it to a different point and that different point looks like this right so the first coordinate of this mapped vector is 1 the second coordinate is f1 square the third is f2 squared um, fourth is f1 f2 fifth is just f1 sixth is just f2 right so this is a two dimensional vector that you give me and then i map it to a six dimensional vector now right so now what is the use of doing this why am i doing this mapping um, so for this let us say you consider this vector u in six dimension let's say you have a six dimensional vector um, and that vector is the following right so that vector is a squared plus b squared minus r squared and i will tell you why we are choosing this vector 1 1 0 minus 2a minus 2b right so this is a six dimensional vector that i am choosing um, which has nothing to do with the data points right so well yeah so it is it is it's a common vector that i am choosing um, it has something to do with the data points we will see what it is but uh, it does not use the data points right so to to uh, define this vector i have not used any of the f1 or f2 of the data points so now what to be observed from this right so i have given a data point i have mapped it to a six dimensional vector and then i have also exhibited a six dimensional vector which i am saying is special with respect to this data set so what is so special about that well we know that each of the data points satisfies this equation here right so the star equation here so because it satisfies the star equation now you can say that each data point satisfies phi of x transpose u equal to 0 where phi is the mapping that maps this two dimensional data point to a six dimensional data point now once i have mapped f1 f2 which is my specific two dimensional data point you put any number here you get a data point uh, on the circle well our data set has if i put any point from the data set uh, as f1 and f2 then that's a point on the circle now i have mapped that to a uh, six dimensional feature using phi right so phi is a map that is uh, that is defined on all of r2 
Uh, but then for those points that are there in my data set, if I use the phi map to map it from a two dimensional space to a six dimensional space, then I immediately notice that all the points in the data set satisfy the equation phi of x transpose u equal to zero, right. So, that is this implies that the data points are all orthogonal to this vector u in the six dimensional space after they have been mapped using this phi map, right. So, that is the data points lie in a linear subspace of R6. Right, so that is the interesting point here, right. So, so what we have done is we have mapped our data points to a high dimensional space. Now, you can verify that the dot product of this is exactly this equation here, right. So, which means that phi of x transpose u equal to 0 is same as equivalent to star, right. So, this is same as star. Let me say equivalent, not implies. So, because this phi of x transpose u equal to 0 is a linear equation in the phi of x space, basically what we are saying is that the data lies in some low dimensional space in this mapped space, right. So, you, you had the data in two dimension, you mapped it to six dimension and now you suddenly observe that, well, the data is not really in, truly in six dimension, it is in a low dimensional space in the six dimensional space, right. So, now the question is, well, what, what is the use of this, right? So, why, fine, so this is fine, so, but how can we convert this into an idea? Well, here is the idea. The idea is the following. Now, given a data, transform features from low dimension Rd to high dimension R capital D, right. So, you have x which is in R D and now you apply some phi and then map it to capital D where you hope that the data lives in a low dimensional subspace. Now, big low dimensional linear subspace, right. So, and because the data lives in a low dimensional linear subspace in this map dimension, now we know already how to extract these low dimensional linear subspace, right. So, the important directions corresponding to these low dimensional linear subspace, that is what our PCA anyway does, right. So, now, um, now because you are doing this mapping, you are increasing the dimension, right. So, which means your D could be really large, but now we already know how to handle the case when D is much large, right. So, we already know uh, how to handle the case when d is much, much larger than n. How do we do that? Well, we know that we do not have to look at uh, uh, the covariance matrix, but we can look at this matrix which is the other way around, right. So, instead of x, x transpose, you would look at x transpose x in the usual PCA, but now because the data points are no longer x, they are phi of x. So, what you would do is you would look at uh, phi of x transpose phi of x. Right. So, instead of phi of x, phi of x transpose. Uh, when I say phi of capital X, it means that I am applying the phi function to every vector in my uh, in my data set, right. So, that is, that's, I mean, a slight abuse of notation, but that is what I mean when I say phi apply to matrix, it applies column wise, okay. So, so this seems like a great idea, right. So, in the sense that we know how to solve issue 1, which is when d is much, much larger, we know how to, you know, uh, uh, solve that problem. Now, we are saying that in the case of nonlinear uh, relationships, you, you map your data points to a higher dimensional space where these nonlinear relationships are captured better. Now, where is the nonlinearity coming from? Now, the nonlinearity is basically, you know, um, absorbed into this phi map. Right. So, the phi map has all possible nonlinear relationships captured. Once you do that, then yes. So, in the high dimensional space, you can find a linear relationship um, using your PCA because D is much, much larger than N, you can still run your PCA, right. So, it seems like a, you know, reasonable idea to, you know, start with um, and, and it is, right. So, and that is what we are going to see how to convert this into a, like a solid idea.
Uh, but then we will hit a lot of bottlenecks, we will hit a lot of issues and then we will have to handle them. Uh, the first issue, the most important issue perhaps is the following. Let us say you had four features. Let us say you had four features and uh, you wanted to uh, capture cubic relations. Think of these four features as height, weight, age, gender, let us say. Right? So, when I say cubic relationships, uh, it means that uh, I should be able to capture relationships such as height into weight into gender or height into weight square into age. Uh, sorry, no, that, that would be fourth power, but let us say height into weight squared or weight squared into age. Right? So, all possible combinations where if you sum up the power of the combinations, they will be 3. Right? So, in this case, uh, so the number of, uh, so basically, if I do the mapping phi, which captures all cubic relationships, in, remember this is a different phi now from the phi that we uh, used earlier. Um, now, this phi will have all possible cubic relationships. Now, this is going to have, be, have a constant uh, f1, f2, f3, f4. Well, these are the uh, relationships which are, I mean, to the power 1. Uh, to the power 2 would have f1, f2, f1, f3 and so on till f3, f4 um, and then there will be 4 choose 2 of them, right. So, this is 4 choose 0, this is 4 choose 1, the 4 is the number of features that you have, uh, k is 4 choose k where k is the number of the power that you are talking about. This will be 4 choose 2 and then there will be f1, f2, f3, f1, f2, f4 and so on. So, there will be 4 choose 3 of these guys, right. So, and then we stop at that because we only care about cubic features, let us say, right. So, now the total dimension of this mapped phi is uh, 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 4, right. So, this is 4 choose 1, 4 choose 2, 4 choose 3. Now, the question is how does this grow, right. So, if I had d features, so in general, if I had d features and if I care about the pth power, right, so d features and want to model pth power relationship uh, at up to pth power, let us say less than or equal to pth power, um, then how many features would the mapped phi have? Now, if, if you think about it, that is going to be sum over i equals 0 to p d c i, that is what it would be. And one can show that this is something like, this grows something like p power p. Now, uh, what does this tell us? This tells us that if d is let us say 10 and I cared about some kind of 15th power relationship, let us say, right. So, now that would mean I would, the mapped phi would have 10 power 15 features. The original dimension had only 10, but then in the mapped space, these are going to be 10 to the 15, right. So, if you, even if you had just two features, but then if you wanted to, for whatever reason, your relationships were so complicated that uh, you need 20th power then it would be, you would have to map your two dimensional feature to a 2 power 20 dimensional space and that is going to be simply too hard to work with, right. So, as the, num as the power increases and as the features increase, so this will become harder and harder. 